returns or satisfaction or getting exactly what they want, right? Yeah. Never. Well, we're going to have some fun today and we're going to talk about different scenarios of personalities and people and I'm sure you will recognize them all and you can imitate and embody them all. Um, but I'm going to give you some ideas, some tips, and some strategies for dealing with those different personalities. And I'm looking forward, actually, to learning some things from you. Just by way of introduction, my name is Kim Hartman. Um, I have spent the last 20 years in the green industry. Um, for a while, I was a garden center manager down in northern Illinois at Craig Bergman's Country Garden, and then out at Countryside in Crystal Lake. I'm also a landscape designer, an Illinois certified nursery professional, and a horticulture educator. I now work for Rossboro Partners, a North Shore landscape design build and um, maintenance firm. So I've had my hands in a lot of the different parts of horticulture and dealt with a lot of customers as well. Now this applies to retail customers. This also applies to the relationships you have with your suppliers and the people that you buy from. Um, this is very top of mind for me because I'm spending a lot of my time now doing purchasing and it's all about those relationships, especially when we have plant shortages and hard goods shortages and supply chain issues. So dealing with those relationships right now can make all the difference between having enough to sell to your customers or not. So that's the idea today. I'm going to show and tell some things, but and don't cringe and don't run out the door. We are going to do a little bit of interaction too, all right? I know. Should I block the door? I think you'll actually have fun with it because you can embody some of these personalities we see. All right, let's talk about tough customers. See these little caricatures up front? Recognize any of those? Or do those look like you at the end of the day? Maybe you need one of those up on the wall at the garden center or your facility to say, okay, which one is me today? And, and warn all your coworkers exactly how you're feeling. So look at those faces over there. Anybody recognize those faces on the right? Oh my God, you don't have my plant. You don't have my hanging basket. You're out of bird seed. Um, the, the grumpy one who's just never happy, never pleased. Things just don't work right. And the one on the bottom, recognize her. I am overwhelmed. You have given me too many choices. I have killed too many plants, I'm new to this, what do I need to do? Now, what do we know? We know there has been 18 million more people gardening in the last two years because of the pandemic. 18 million more people. They need our help. And spending time in garden centers, spending time as a master gardener as well, they have a whole bunch of questions. It used to be our profile of our customer, the average customer was me. A late 50s woman who's been gardening all her life, who grew up with 4-H, her grandma taught her how to garden, I grew up on a farm, that was your profile, even five or 10 years ago. And we all got a little nervous as garden center managers going, our core population is aging out, weren't we? The average age of a gardener right now is between 35 and 44. The number one reason those gardeners started gardening was mental health. I need to get out from behind my computer, out behind teaching my kids how to learn at home, out from my four walls and get into my own yard or get into a community garden or get into a place that is a sanctuary that's going to lower my blood pressure, that's going to make me feel more comfortable. And I'm, I'm going to do that. The number two reason people started gardening, to spend more time with their families. We used to call gardening yard work. Does yard work sound as pleasing? It sounds like work. But now we talk about building pollinator gardens and growing your own food and starting that tree from a little seedling, that feels different. Mm -hmm. And that's our story to tell. So in dealing with tough customers, it's changing that frame. It's why are you here? Why are you coming to my retail garden center? You're coming for the experience. I don't know about you, but we had people, especially in the winter, because our garden centers um, was open year round, 
come in January and February for horticulture therapy, literally to walk through the house plants. We hoped they brought something when they were there, but it, it was a respite. It was a way to get out and get into nature. Um, what we have to understand about tough customers, in most cases, are their objections, their concerns, rational and logical? Are they? Or are they emotional? And we need to understand the difference and how we respond to it. Because we, as garden center staff, as garden center managers, often re respond with facts. Well, this is the sale price, this is the guarantee, this is the expectation. We're not reacting and responding to their feelings and why they feel the way they do about it. So we're going to talk a lot about the difference between sort of that rational, logical response and an emotional response. If you win over one of these three over here, you've got a lifelong customer that's going to tell their friends. But as you know, you make them mad once, they're going to tell twice as many and they're going to tell them twice as often. So turning around these tough customers really pays off your business. It's also been really tough on our staff, hasn't it? When we have those rude customers, those entitled customers, those overly demanding customers, you're like, I'm just here to help. I'm short staffed. You know, I think people in the hospitality industry work like that, working in the, in the um, garden center business too. And we are so seasonal. And everybody wants all their seeds at once, all of their vegetable plants at once, all of their pansies, and then all their petunias and geraniums at once, and trying to respond to all of that. So setting expectations. We want to think about your staff. This isn't just about how to please the customers. For the 20 years before I worked in the horticulture industry, I worked as a communication and employee engagement consultant. And how does that matter to the green industry? If your people that work with and for you are not engaged, they're not presenting your best face to the customer. So our mantra, the place I work now, take care of your own staff first. Then they're gonna take care of the customer. No, the customer is not always right. And no, not every customer is a good one. One of the messages I'm gonna share with you today is how to let some customers go. And we see it in the retail world, we see it in the wholesale world, we see it in the landscaping world. There are customers that suck our time, are never pleased, aren't gonna give us good reviews online or in person. Maybe we're not a good fit. It's okay to let them go and focus on those that you have a good relationship with. Anybody ever go through Dale Carnegie training? I'm dating myself right here, but back in the day, Back in the 80s, this was the thing. And learning how to develop relationships and develop loyalty. When dealing with people, remember, you're not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion and how we best respond to that. Anybody heard the whole emotional intelligence framework before? Is this familiar to anyone? A couple? It's very helpful. And I will tell you, it's very helpful when dealing with tough customers. I'll tell you, it can also help you deal with your kids, <laughs> your spouses, your friends, because it's evaluating where you are on the spectrum and your strengths. So what I would say to you is look at this model, and we'll walk through each one, and look at yourself first. Look in the mirror. Where, where am I most emotionally intelligent? Am I really good at empathy? There are certain situations in our retail garden center where the individual that had an issue or a concern really just need to be heard. They weren't looking for something free. They weren't looking for a replacement. They weren't looking to you know, further damage our reputation. They just wanted someone to listen. Will you find those people in your staff that are the most empathetic and the best listeners, they engage that person. So it's not always, well, have them talk to the manager or have them talk to the owner. Identify within your team who's best at this. Where I used to work, our owner was very factual, very logical, um, some would say very direct. You put that person with this person that just wanted to be heard, it's not gonna go well. 
So she was, back to the upper left quadrant, self-aware enough to say, Kim, I need you to handle this one because you spend more time listening. Yes, you can still hold the line and be firm and direct, but in a more compassionate way. And that doesn't mean she's better or worse, or I'm better or worse. We just have different strengths. So I think this model is very valuable in looking at your own strengths, looking at those areas you need to work on, and looking at your staff. And if anybody wants any of this information, I can make this available and um, email the file to you too. I saw a few of you taking pictures. Um, I can give it to you. Um, how confident are you in that situation? I don't know about you, but within our garden center, we were really trying to empower more of our staff to take care of questions and concerns. So our department managers and our owners weren't just dealing with problems. That, that it takes its toll on all of those people as well. So giving them more autonomy and authority and giving the self-confidence to your staff to handle those situations gives them confidence, gives them strength to do those things and has them be more self-aware. Relationship management. It's how strong is your staff at delegating? How strong is your staff at empowering other people to do things? Sharing information as opposed to a command and control style. Keeping information close to the best. The more information that's out there, here's what we're seeing in terms of trends, demands, shortages, and getting that information out to all of your staff so you can provide context for these explanations that you're having with these tough customers is important. It's teaching them how to deal with conflict. I had one of the other owners of our business will avoid conflict at all costs. Well, what happens when you avoid conflict over and over and over again and just keep kicking that can down the road? At some point, do we all want that experience? No. So conflict doesn't necessarily have to connote negative. We have a difference of opinion. We have a different approach. Respect those differences. Agree to disagree and let's do something about it and be emotionally intelligent about it. And then finally, self-management. Are you the cynical, pessimistic one? Are you the bad apple in the bunch? Are you the one that just needs to vent and complain all the time? Now trust me, especially coming through the last couple years, we all need to vent. And coming to shows and events like this, we get to share those stories. You're gonna do it today when you see some of these profiles and scenarios, but doing it to the extent that it changes your point of view, it changes how you communicate, it changes your demeanor. It changes your body language. If you're always on the defensive, if you're always looking down, you're not making eye contact, you're avoiding, or you're you know, in an angry, frustrated, stressed out state, what does that say to that person on the other side of the conversation with you? So be very aware of some of those cues that you're giving off non-verbally as well. And yes, have some self-control, but also do something about it. I had something, and I still do it with the, my team that I work with. When they bring me an issue or a problem, I want them to bring me a suggested idea of what we're going to do about it, too. They don't get to come up with all the solutions, but I'm going to be an active listener and say, OK, I hear you, and I agree that we need to work on this. What do you think we do next? So there's some shared accountability. So that you, as leaders, as owners, as managers, aren't just taking all that responsibility back on you coming to those solutions together to help serve those customers. Here, here's the difference. This might help you understand more in terms of the difference between someone that has low emotional intelligence and high emotional intelligence. So on the sort of angry point of view, someone that has low emotional intelligence is going to come off as aggressive and demanding and egotistical and self-centered and selfish. You know those people? And it doesn't have to define the person. Let me be careful about that. It defines the behavior in that situation. As opposed to someone that's assertive, ambitious, driving, strong, willed, and decisive. Different framework, same behaviors, different context. And then we get some of the gender differences here, don't we? When a woman is particularly strong or direct, you know, is that received the same way as a man? Not always. I'm going to say that out loud. 
It's true. Um, if someone's demanding, what's the difference between de demanding and ambitious? There's some gray area in there. But I would encourage all of you, when you're reacting to someone coming to you with a question or a tough problem, what's their real motivation and emotion behind it? Let's look at the next section. If someone is just, seems like they're lackadaisical and they're not listening well and they're just making smart aleck remarks and they're kind of like, you know, what we would call the slacker mentality versus someone that just likes to socialize, they're extroverted, they need that interaction in order to warm up to, okay, what are we gonna do next and how are we gonna get our job done and how are we gonna take care of our customers? They can be your most charming and persuasive people. You know, it, it's, ironically, how do you deal with toddlers? I have an almost three-year-old granddaughter. What do you do when she falls down and bumps her knee and there's no blood and it's not an emergency? You distract. You moved on to something else. Guess what? That applies to grown-ups too. It's like, let's not just make this all about what just happened and the negative. Let's move it to something more enthusiastic and positive. You'll have those people that are like, I'm not going to change. This has always worked. Why do we want to you know, change things in the midst of this high demand for all of our services? I'm going to be stubborn. I'm going to, you know, hold my own and not cooperate. Those people can also be the people that will keep us from getting overly ambitious, from buying too much and having too much in our garden center. I know that's hard to believe right now, but I think people as they're looking into 2023 are like, how do we predict now? I know that feels a little different than it did a year ago in terms of how much we need. Those, those same people are going to keep us grounded. They're going to give us balance. You know, for, for those of us that are very optimistic and let's go and let's get things done, we need those people that are saying, well, what about, and we need this in place to do that, and we have to have enough staff to do that, otherwise we're not going to do it well. So change your frame. And then finally, those people that are always fussy, hard to please, you know, sometimes that's the hardest to deal with, let's look at them as being detailed and that they care that much more, that they're thorough. And this is our staff, this is our customers. And they're more systemic about it. This is probably the most telling piece of advice that I'm going to give you today. Do you know what that stands for? Why am I talking? As I said, the number one way to deal with a tough customer is be quiet. Listen. It's the number one rule of negotiating, too. If you've ever gone through any negotiation or sales training, you don't put your offer out there first. You let them ask. You let them put forth their objectives, their felt needs, their criteria, and then you listen. You probably heard the old adage, we have two ears and one mouth. So that means we should be listening twice as long as we should be talking. Make sense? I will tell you, I, I, and I can't tell you how many people, especially people that aren't as experienced with dealing with these tough issues and questions, it's like, oh, I'll give you that for free, or I'll give you a discount, or we'll get it for you tomorrow. And we jump to sort of like these real you know, reactive solutions. Customers not even expecting that. After you listen and you Reflect back to them what you've heard. I understand you were disappointed in the quality of your hanging baskets this year. How often did you water them? Did you use our recommended fertilizer? Where were they located? Asking more questions. Those questions are also giving them pointers how to improve without criticizing them. And it's also demonstrating that you're knowledgeable and you're an expert in helping them through that. If they get to that end of that question and say, I still want three new hanging baskets for free, work it out. But get through all that. Don't just jump to that type of thing. But reflect what you're hearing. So I heard you say you watered, but you didn't fertilize. Well, a petunia hanging basket, by the time we get to mid-August, is not going to look great if you don't do X, Y, and Z. So we're going to do better next time. 
and then it's not going to cost your business money trying to re um, replace them. Look at their emotional state. How agitated are they? How upset are they? How stubborn are they feeling? Part of this is also taking that customer in a different place, a different context. How many of you interact with these tough co customers by cash registers? Or up by where all your other customers are watching and listening? Give them some privacy. Give them some space. Take them out to the plant material or the hard goods or whatever that you're talking about and they have questions about. Because that also gives you a minute to gather your thoughts, to wait, to listen, to walk, to move. Sometimes just a couple minutes. Simmer down. You know, take a little time out. Show empathy. I, what you're really hearing, you know, when my hanging baskets die, I'm having a graduation party this weekend and my house isn't going to look nice. That's the real issue. Mm -hmm. So what can we do instead to have you, help you have a great graduation party? <clears throat> it's not about the facts to do with that petunia. So dig deeper, ask questions and then listen very actively and wait. So here's some words again. These are the kind of things I have on the side of my um, bulletin board, you know, it's just like those pictures on the front page. It's like, what is my mindset going into the day? What is my mindset going into this tough conversation I need to have with a customer, with my staff, with my team? And this is where emotional intelligence come in. How am I feeling and what am I bringing to that relationship and that conversation? And what is my customer feeling? Listening for those words. When they say, the tree I planted as a memorial to my father that died, died. That's happened. Do you start talking about what the replacement tree should be? Tell me about your dad. Tell me why this type of tree was important to you. Compassion, empathy, emotion. You'll sell them another tree, but that's over here. So watch and listen for some of those anecdotes. So, speaking of planting of some trees, this is where we're going to have a little fun. All right, find a partner. So, pair up as best you can. You don't need to know each other or anything. This is easy. The customer comes in to see you. I want to plant some trees. Anybody come in with that kind of question? I want to plant some trees. You're going to take three minutes right now and work through, one of you be the person selling, one of you be the customer, and ask follow-up questions. Unpack that question. What follow-up questions would you ask? And then we're going to debrief in a minute. All right, go. I want to buy some trees. I want, excuse me, I want to plant some trees.
garden tree, and shade tree, and garden tree, and like just kind of um, get to the root of what I was doing. See what you did there? Root. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unintentional. Yeah. yeah. The, the sun and shade factors. Okay. All right. How about back here? Did I just hear why do you want to plant a tree? I, I, so far, I've heard a lot of what. Was the why to do with, and what was the answer? Why did you want to plant a tree? I wanted to put some shade in my garden. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Who's next? Yeah? Um, again, why I was picking a tree for the shade and so it can grow with my family. All right, I just heard an emotional touch point. A lot of you had a lot of factual sun, shade, you know, deciduous flowering, you know, evergreen, da 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 da, for my family. When we make purchasing decisions, especially with things with disposable income like plants and garden goods, most of them are made based on emotion. So, very good. How about you two? Uh, why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> and what was your answer? Right. <laughs> you can play this game. <laughs> All right. How about you two? I was uh, asked about uh, what I want to plant where, yeah. and uh, why well, I said can I say house, and then well, how high and if it blooms and things like that. So okay. Good. Good. How about you two? I would say shade and the color of the tree. Okay. All right. Good. Good. I know you didn't interact, but what what's the most important answer to that question for you? Well, why is definitely a good one. And what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. If it's, uh, I often ask where most of you live, and our our zone changes so quickly where our garden mm -hmm. center is. So yeah. that's important information. Make want to make sure it lives, yeah. especially for the memorial trees, and I want it bulletproof. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quite too. I went 20 trees, and he said, well, if you plant all the same trees, you won't die, so probably all going to die. And that, that all created some diversity uh, in my head, and I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should change my plans, and then I wanted to go over the same. So you came in with a preconceived notion, yeah. but the conversation shifted that. Yeah. So you educated him as part of it. Because he's like, I got this plan, I'm like, well, is that the best plan, though? Mm -hmm. And we have to be able and strong enough and confident enough to have that yeah. conversation. Did anybody read this question as the customer wanted to plant their own trees? Did you get into that at all? Who's planting the trees? Because I don't know how many of you, our garden center used to offer planting services. So that's a good way to also enter into that conversation. Let me show you some things. I would encourage you to ask and consider more of these types of questions. All of us are horticulturists. All of us are plant nerds. We, you all talked a lot about conditions and culture and characteristics of trees. Again, back to what is the goal? Is it ornamental? Is it something for my family? Is it providing more shade? The number one reason in our garden center that we sold Arborvita was what? Yes. So this wasn't about how tall do you want your arborvita to be? What's your goal? Because I might sell you 20 arborvita then, not two. And I might sell you emerald arborvita, not technia arborvita, because you have a long, narrow yard. So it's unpacking and um, asking more of those questions. Um, you have needle cast disease on your spruce, you know, back to your diversity. Um, emerald ash borer, you know, all the things that have taken our trees down. 
or, or there's invasive, that type of thing. I recently lost trees. If you hear that, I don't know about you. Um, were you affected by the polar vortex a couple of years ago a lot? We were in Northern Illinois. I had a beautiful Japanese maple get taken out. I grieved for that plant. That was an emotional loss to lose that plant. You know, you don't replace something like that quickly. Or there's something that are heirloom plants that maybe we got from friends or relatives or that type of thing. We gotta work people through that grief. Or I just cut down an oak tree and it's gonna take a new oak, a generation to grow. So understand some of how did they get here? Why are they wanting to have some trees? We talked to Memorial, whether they wanna plant them themselves. I just wanna plant more trees because I want to be more environmentally conscious. I want more shade in my yard. I want to save energy. I want wildlife or I don't. Because I can't tell you how many people want ornamental trees, but they don't want fruit. <laughs> and I'm happy so you can give them a better solution. Diversity, you talked about that. I want my kids to have something to climb. There's those emotional needs. You see what I'm getting at here? These are some of the other reasons that they might not express right away. They're gonna come in and tell you, I want an oak and maple, a crab apple, or red bud, but you wanna know why. You wanna know what goals. Because you're gonna have a happier, more engaged, more accountable customer in that. They're gonna take better care of that tree, too. And then you're not having to replace it if you have a warranty, or you're not having a frustrated customer. This is what our customers want and expect from us. I don't know how, if you at your garden centers have um, a mission, vision, and values or any type of expectations for employees when it comes to customer interaction or sales. I think it's valuable to articulate that, put it on the wall, um, have some basic tenets that you're going to follow. We are going to be friendly. We are going to be warm. That might seem common sense. That might seem given. But it's May 15th. It's Mother's Day weekend. <sighs> Friendly and warm. Okay, we can do that. Um, we're going to be empathetic. We're going to take a minute. We're going to wait. We're going to listen. We're going to be fair. We're going to treat people consistently. How many of your tough customers want special treatment? Well, I spend $10,000 a year here, therefore, or I'm in here all the time, therefore, or I'm on the Chamber of Commerce or the Women's Club or whatever, therefore, are many of those customers your most demanding, neediest, time-consuming customer? Think about that and, and evaluate that. So say, how many of them want donations? You know, I'm having an event and there's nothing wrong with charitable donations, but there is a little expectation of some reciprocity. You know, if I'm going to donate to your event, your fundraiser, I would like you to promote our garden center, our activities, our that type of thing. And be consistent about that. Because when you make those exceptions and you give someone a different discount or different terms or different time frame, all the variables, the word gets out. Um, let them feel like they have some control over the decision. Sometimes in our horticulture excitement, we start over explaining. Did you ever find yourself doing that? Well, we have this grand, grand new um, crab apple and it's royal raindrops and it's pink flowers and it's a purple foliage and it would be perfect for your yard and we haven't asked all the questions first. Because we just got a new shipment and we're excited to sell. Take a minute and, you know, we can't help ourselves. So making sure they feel like they have some voice and control in the decision. Give them alternatives, but not too many. Um, we used to have over 50 varieties of coral bells, probably 150, 200 varieties of hosta, you know, 75 varieties of daylily. At some point, it's up to us to curate as growers, as buyers, as retailers, what we think is going to live, what is going to be most successful in areas. Still give, giving people choice, but not so much choice that they get paralyzed. So give them options and alternatives, but not too many, and give them access to information. Um, that 35 to 44 year old profile I talked about, they are online shopping your store, 
shopping your website, looking up plants before they ever step foot in your store. It's not just the millennials. Believe it or not, my mom even goes online now, and she's 83. So know that they're getting information, and you might have to re-educate them sometimes because they're like, well, great. You know, I'm looking for a 40-foot tree. Well, that tree is 10-foot right now. And the expectations of what it takes to grow and to expand and feed and be successful, it's helping to educate them. All right, let's go back in here. I'm going to skip ahead to this one and show you the profiles. We're going to have a little fun with that. Don't be afraid to use humor. Don't be afraid to lighten the mood. You guys are doing it in your interaction. Smile. And it's, if you get to a certain point with that tough customer, it's like, what will it take for you to feel better about the situation? Literally, ask that question. What will it take for you to feel better about the situation? Feel better. Again, you're not giving stuff away. It, it, it's recognizing that they're feeling something. And oftentimes, that's going to take them back a little bit because they're not expecting that type of question. But that's really what they want to tell you how they feel and have it be heard. Um, if it's a serious issue, you know, an heirloom tree, a memorial tree died, um, you're building something that's uh, a memorial, um, it, it, a tree fell down, you know, people have had trees fall down in the house. I've had some very contentious issue, issues with neighbors, their trees over my yard and vice versa, or their tree fell in my house and we're trying to replace it, and insurance claims, and other. yeah, those are serious issues. But in most other cases, you can be funny, happy, silly, and, and be clever. But most important on this page, empathetic. And don't forget, it's OK to be an expert, but not overwhelmed. Anybody recognize these questions? Look down that list. I love this as a landscape designer. Do you guys do no cost consultations? Would you have a repairman come to your house you know, to fix your dryer, your TV, your roof, whatever, for free? Why is it that we do that in this industry? Do we think we have to take a loss in order to get that business? Not anymore. Our time is valuable. So think about any of those services and putting a value on some of those. And yes, we charge for that. Don't you love this? I love this from a landscape design, and I know you get it in retail all the time. I want it to have lots of color, and I want it to be no maintenance. Okay. <laughs> Which one? Because you don't get both. Um, and, and, and working through that. So that's one of those unpacking again, okay? What do you mean by that? We're going to have more evergreens, less annuals, you know, blah, 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 blah. You will get into these issues, the ones toward the bottom of the page. Are you getting questions about glyphosate? Are you getting questions about EMS? Uh-huh. Be prepared for those answers. Be prepared in terms of your staff being able to handle those answers. Give customers choices of products they can use. We used to have something called the wall of death. You all know it. Um, and, and most of it was synthetic and you know, kill, 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 uh, all the sides on the wall. I would say in the 15 years I was there, it migrated from a 90-10 to about 70% organic, natural, etc. Now to do about 30% of using the more aggressive um, tools. Don't make up customers' minds for them on these issues. Say, here's the information, educate yourself, come to your own conclusions. But know that there are choices. Because there's always more to every story about the neomix, about glyphosate. The biggest mistake I see people make, though, is, well, if it kills that weed, it's going to, uh, that's great. Not recognizing it's going to kill everything. It's like understanding the difference between selective and not selective. Ever get that? You know, my lawn is now dead, or my, you know, all my flowers all die because I spread glycified on a windy day. So be careful with these scientific communications. I'm going to put my master gardener hat on right now. There's all kinds of tools from your university extension program, whether it's Wisconsin, Illinois, or any other state, that is science research-based information that you can make available 
through the links on your website, through publications at your information counter, about these types of things. But in your product mix, give people choices. How do you plant a tree well? You know, the whole tree volcanoes, are you supposed to take burlap off? Are you supposed to take the wire off? Have policies and practices and protocols so therefore these things don't come into questions. Be clear and consistent about your guarantees. And I, I don't know about you, have you had people try to return plants that they didn't even buy from you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. And, and call them on it. And we've, we've had people more than once. It's okay for some of those types. That's not the customer you want. Because from an integrity point of view. Oh, and, and, yeah. And then they're screaming at you that it's me. <laughs> and it's, you know, it says Home Depot or the barcode or you recognize the pot. Yeah. It, 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 be consistent. That's the one you do want to do in public. So, there's your eight profiles. Which one do you see most often? All of them. <laughs> and we didn't gender profile here. This is just for an example. Um, but here, let me run through these quick. Argument of the Annie, always contrary, always disagreeing. Well, will contradict themselves, even. Um, the most important thing with this person, this is where weight is really important. If you interrupt this person, they will start over. And they will do it again. And they will get louder, won't they? You, you know her. Literally, give her physical space. Give her time. This is where all your horticultural knowledge does come in. Because sometimes when people are having such an emotional reaction, such a contrarian reaction, coming back to facts. Even if you have to pull out, you know, here's a publication, pull something up on the computer, behind the information desk, you know, here's what zone this is, here's how you take care of it, da da da. They just need more information and they tend to back up a little bit. Don't overwhelm them and make them feel patronized or condescended to. But this is where logic does work, if they're contrarian. Sell the benefits and features, but let her come to her own conclusions. All right, bully, bully, billy. We have some of our customers at the Garden Center that tended to be more affluent, tended to be more entitled. Um, very focused on status, or that they had a prominent business in your community for whatever, they, because of their ego, won't talk to anybody but the owner. Do you ever get some of these? Or the most senior leader? Because it's like, I need to go straight to the top because I'm important. And you need to let them feel important. These are rude, loud, very biased, opinionated. This is the person in particular that goes back to the back office or the conference room or in the back 40, wherever, so you can engage them without making a spectacle. Lower your voice, breathe, pause. In many argumentative Annie, you match, but you match with knowledge. Bully Billy, you don't want to be bullied, and you never want any of your staff to be bullied, but you deflate the situation first. And if that doesn't work, then they are not your customer anymore. It's like, thank you, this is not a good fit. You might consider going down the road. And it's okay uh, to do that. Don't take it personally. It's tough when it's someone like this. Um, if they need a little stroking to feel exclusive and special, and we appreciate all the donations you've made to our community and how frequently you and your family come to our garden center, but still hold your ground. It's okay to say no, but, as you should with any bully. But in this customer context, firmly, calmly. Not getting agitated yourself. Like I said, there might be a better place for his business. Hard to please Henry. He's trying to get a better deal. He's got an agenda. Um, I, I, I've seen people do this with trees, with shrubs. I've seen them um, change tags. I've seen people take soul tags off of things. Any of these things happen to you? People take things out of the soul area. Um, he'll say, oh, there's a broken branch on here. Can you take 20% off? Um, or I'm buying 50 perennials. You know, 
can you give me a deal? And you know, people look a little tired or they're not blooming anymore. And it's like, again, consistency, stay firm. Um, make sure, this is where consistency, consistency is important because this is the guy, he's gonna go ask your perennial manager, then he's gonna ask the cashier, then he's gonna ask you until he gets the answer he wants. I never had this happen. Yeah. So that's where you've got to be consistent. This person, get it in writing. You know, even if you don't normally do contracted services, maybe you have planting or design services or you know, potting services for containers, that type of thing. We will have three 24-inch pots, you know, that are $89.99 a piece that are available on May 25th. I need you, customer, to sign it when he shows up on May 15th and says, are my pots ready? Nope, May 25th. So make sure you cover yourself. Um, don't push on them. See that theme coming through? Impatient item. So impatient item and tends to be the one that, you know, I just showed up, I want you all to stop what you're doing because I'm here. You know, I don't care that there's five people in line. I don't care if there's three other people on the phone. I'm here. I need to talk to someone and I need to talk to someone now. Look at her face. Does that just tell a story right there? You don't have to hear a word from her. Um, she'll let you know she cannot wait. The irony, and you know Ida's, these are usually the people with the most time, aren't they? <laughs> and they're looking to socialize and they're looking for the challenge and the you know, engagement of being out in a retail environment. Ask the question, what's your timing? Are you trying to get something installed this week? Are you trying to get something delivered tomorrow? Do you need to take these with you today? Do these need to get in the ground? Um, delegate, delegate, delegate. Don't pull off of those customers that are following the appropriate behaviors for impatient Ida. Um, give her choices. You know that triangle of you can have it, you know, at a certain price on budget and um, quality, you know, the whole quality time dollar thing. You can't always have all three. Find out which of the three are most important. And for her, it's usually time. And she'll pay extra for it. And don't be afraid to charge more. If you need an overnight delivery, if you need multiple deliveries, if you need consultation time that your staff's going to spend, charge for it. Because I will have people come into the garden center and it turns into a full-scale landscape design consultation and they haven't paid for it. Ever had that happen? Indecisive that. <gasps> They can't make up their mind. Do you know Ed? Has he been in your garden son? What's he most concerned about? Go back to that triangle, the price, quality, and timing, availability. Introduce some urgency. Ed, I've got 10 minutes to spend. Here's some information, think more about it. Use our tools, use our website. Here's another staff person, but I need to move on. Or you spend some more time and get back to us. Create some parameters, create some expectations. Don't feel like you have to give something away and sweeten the deal just to get them to make a decision. Well, if I give you 20% discount, will you sign today? Or will you take 50 of those Arbor Vita? You, they eat up so much of your time. So work through it with indecisive net. Um, know it all, Nellie. This is the one that's done all her internet research. This is the one that is going, well, according to Cornell University, we should be planting these tomatoes and X, Y, Z and using this type of uh, soil amendment. Um, respond to her ego. Don't necessarily, if you find some of her information isn't accurate or appropriate, don't worry about correcting right away. Just say, I appreciate how much you care and how much research you're doing and how thorough you are. Obviously, you want to be successful. Here's what I can do to help you be successful and sort of reset that conversation. Don't get into an argument. Well, glyphosate kills people. Here's the research-based information. Come to your conclusions. Here are your options. Um, you're right. And then give her some more information. Um, Moody Mindy, very unpredictable. Um, smiling and happy. And then she won't be speaking the next. Usually there's more to the story with this one. And these are some of your regular customers. 
this is where it's okay to be more empathetic and listen and find out what's happening. Um, let her know you're around when she needs something, but let her work through whatever emotions are pushing it. She's gonna come in often. We have a lot of senior citizens, and it's not just senior citizens, but it's more often than not, that come in because this is a social experience to come to the dark center and, and spend some more time. And they may be having a tougher time of day, especially coming off COVID and feeling isolated, the fact that they finally got comfortable coming out. Go at her pace as best as you can. Give her ideas of what people and other situations like hers have done. Or have her talk to other customers. Give her referrals or testimonials. And then finally, no boundaries, nor up. Um, this is the person who's still out in your yard when it's, you know, 6.30, and you're having to like, yeah, we've, we're closed. Um, this is the person that is gonna call or text if you've given out your number or leave frequent messages and if they just like are impulsive about how much. Um, only respond within business hours. Only sell things within business hours. Create some parameters. I would have customers calling me because there were some that had my cell phone number at 5, 5.30 in the morning. I was in the shower and I thought of a tree I would like. I learned not to answer those calls and return them until it was during business hours. Set the boundaries for your benefit as well as this um, customer's benefit. And if I can leave you with one thought of dealing with all eight of these personalities, under promise, over deliver. We want to please. We want more profit. We want more customers. We want more sales. And sometimes we get ourselves in trouble by over promising. So, under promise, over deliver. So, share these lessons that you learned with your staff. Um, talk about it, do some of these role plays. Um, if you want, take those eight type of customers and role play through some of them with your staff as a learning thing. Um, if you've got some seasonal staff that come back in late March, early April, use this as part of their training as well. But share those successes too. Sometimes we forget to say, you know what? I had a great customer experience. I sold them a tree or I sold them 20 trees and that felt good, so don't be afraid to do that. All right, thanks for bearing with us on time. Um, obviously, we could talk about this a lot and share ideas, but we would like some feedback from you. You do have an evaluation form on the chair uh, next to you. Um, if you could please answer both the structured question and give us any ideas for future topics, we would appreciate it. If you would put my name, Kim Hartman, up on the top, um, and the tough customer is the topic, We'll make sure we compile your results. And thank you for being here. And good luck.